Who am I talking with this afternoon? I'm Dave Donahue, uh, intellectual property and technology litigator with Holland and Knight. And I've known you, Dave, uh, for how many years since you started a blog? 14, 15? Yeah. Which is scary all the way around. <laughs> <It> <laughs> is. Um, why did you want to start a blog? I wanted to start a blog in part because I was in-house and I wasn't writing enough. I wanted to be writing more. I also um, had seen a few people at that time start blogging and really become thought leaders, and I thought I had some value to add and something to say, and I wanted to get it out there. Yeah, and I can remember the first time we talked, and you said, and I said, you know, what's the goal? <clears throat> I said, you know, I want to be doing IP litigation for a very large firm in downtown Yep, <laughs> downtown Chicago. You know, part of me was like, well, that's that's ambitious. <laughs> that was definitely my goal. Where were you working at that time? I was at Delphi Technologies, yeah. a tier one auto supplier. Right. <clears throat> what happened as a result of the blog? What started to happen? What did you start to see go on? How long did it take? Um, first thing was friends noticed that I was doing it. People that I had worked with. Uh, in big law, saw that I was blogging, reached out to ask about it, either because they were interested in doing it or because they were interested in something I wrote. Um, frankly, that led to job opportunities in the first instance where I already had some credibility as a lawyer and that reminded them of, of my ability and sort of my um, drive and effort. Um, then I started hearing from clients and potential clients. Uh, it was probably 18 months and I got some um, sort of one-off for me as, as a, an IP litigator, uh, inventors that maybe weren't the right um, client base for me, but uh, it showed me that it worked. It was sort of an early proof of concept. And then at about two years, um, maybe two and a half years, I got a call from a fairly large corporate entity saying, we have a problem in Chicago. Um, You've been writing about a variety of issues around it. You look like the guy who knows uh, what we need. Can we talk to you? Um, and I went to see him and got my first uh, large corporate client from the blog. Yeah, <coughs> you write on on IP litigation in Northern District of Illinois. Yeah, right. a separate blog on retail patent litigation as well. Right. <coughs> what's What's your approach when you're when you're looking at IP litigation, Northern District, <coughs> and and or the district court, and then probably circuit court as well. But what do you look at, and what do you blog on? So, <coughs> the nice thing about my area, which focused on the Chicago federal courts and IP, I'm able to run a written opinions report from Pacer, the court's website, and have a whole list of things to write about. So I take those opinions. Because I'm at a big firm, I get them um, conflict checked to make sure that we don't have some issue with me writing about them. And then from those that I'm allowed to write about, um, I'll write about the most interesting ones. I'll skip some of the most rote ones. But I, I'm able to tell my clients and prospective clients because of that process that I've read every IP decision from the court over the last 15 years. And that's something probably nobody <laughs> else can say. Yeah. Do you use that, you know, a, a, as leverage when you're going out and saying, "I'd like to be general counsel. I'd like to be local counsel in a particular case." To let let general counsel know about that. Absolutely. So if I'm going to write a, a, an email to a client or a potential client about a, a new matter in Chicago, one of the things I'm going to send to them is the um, tags page for the blog for the judge that they're going to be before, and I'm able to say either. I, here's my analysis of the, your type of issue and IP issues generally from that judge, either over the judge's entire career in many cases today, or at least over the last 15 years. And again, I don't think there's anybody else that can say that over the last 15 years or the judge's career, they have read all their decisions and uh, analyzed most of them. Okay, we're back at it. Um, as far as the number of uh, cities around the country that have a district court and appellate court um, where somebody could be doing IP litigation, there's a number of lawyers you know, that have, I, I, maybe dabbling is the right word, but they've, they've done some of it, but they haven't remained consistent. Why do you think that is? Uh, I, I think that it's tough to be consistent. Right. I, 
Uh, for a while on my blog, I kept a list of regional IP bloggers. And at times yep. there were 10, 15, 20 of them, which is probably about the right number in terms of regions. Right. There, uh, Michael Smith in East Texas started around the time I did. He might have started before me. Uh, there are some firms in Delaware that do a version of it um, that have kind of stuck with it more or less. People have tried in Eastern District of Virginia, Massachusetts, um, a handful of other districts around the country. But I think it's really about being willing to keep going when things get busy. Yeah. How valuable would that be as a body of work? I'm just even thinking for secondary, I don't know if secondary law is the perfect thing, but it's close because you're giving insight and commentary on judicial, on judicial decisions both at the district court and the appellate court, if you had that across the country. I think it's really important. Uh, you know, it's important from the trends that you can see. Like I will identify certain things with certain types of opinions or um, we have a couple of judges in the district that have some quirks that are important to understand. Uh, and my opinions highlight those for people and can save embarrassment and some fines for the lawyers on the cases. Stuff that you'd have to really dig for in, and be looking for in Westlaw to find it. Um, the other thing, I um, at one point did a post on the top 25 or 50 things to know about the district or a series of posts that added up yep. to that number. Um, and I've been told that a number of big firms around the city send their lawyers, their new lawyers, to read those posts as part of their education with the firm about how to handle right. cases. Here. And that, that's a big deal. You don't get that other places. I mean, over time, you've been doing this for 15 years. I mean, your, your stature, you know, in the IP litigation bar in Chicago, it's got to make you feel pretty good with the, the level you've reached. And I'm sure you're always trying to get better. I mean, the blogging has to play a large role in that, how you're viewed among the community, the judiciary, the whole thing. I mean, you, I mean you're a lawyer's lawyer. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, I, um, one, you know, I, I've got cases in the district, so judges and other lawyers see me in those cases, but it's going to be, you know, one group of lawyers at one firm or two or three firms if it's a particularly large case and, and a judge and a magistrate. So you can only touch so many people at one time, whereas with the blog, I've got judges reading the blog, I've got clerks reading the blog. Um, and in fact, at one point, uh, somebody in the media said something that I took offense with about a judge in the district, and I wrote about it and said I thought it was beneath the particular editor of a particular newspaper who wrote the piece, uh, and it was offensive to the court. Um, and I heard through kind of channels from the judge indirectly thanking me because no one else had stood up for the judge uh, and the judge didn't feel that the judge could respond. Well, at one time you won it. Didn't you win a journalism award here locally? I did. I won a journalism award uh, for my reporting about a series of local patent rules that the, ju that the judges here uh, installed five or ten years ago. And it was an award that was often run by reporters who are reporting on like terrible conditions for children or prisons um, and as a lawyer not a trained journalist I won that award for my reporting. Yeah which is pretty. <coughs> I was a big honor for me. I would think it would be a huge honor for you um, to do that. I mean coming at it from a, from a person that's not normally covering those type of things or working in that arena all the time. <coughs> Where you're sitting today, um, I mean I, I'm not asking you you know which cases come from the blog or whatever, but what's the role of your blog in business development today? You know, so if other lawyers that are thinking about blogging are coming to you and asking, how does this work? What's its role? How do the cases find you? You seem to be doing well. You have a good reputation. What's the blog's role in all of that? So there's a group of clients that'll find mm -hmm. me from the blog. They'll be doing their research, uh, and the in-house lawyer or the principal of the company will identify me as a thought leader and reach out directly. Um, or I've written about something similar, and they'll reach out to get my thoughts. Um, and then the other place is really as a thought leader. It's exactly um, the clearest thing you can do with the blog. So I might email a client or a potential client and say to them, you've been sued. Here are my thoughts about your defense, and here are my blog posts about that judge's opinion, either for the last 15 years, or opinions 
on all of their IP cases over the last 15 years or for their entire time on the bench. And that's something that differentiates me and my team because nobody else can say that. Yeah. <coughs> Our mission or my mission is to c connect lawyers with people you know, for good. Um, and that can mean different things in different types of situations. Um, you know, when I think of you, you know, personally, I think of, you know, you have three kids, you're living in Chicago, um, not the cheapest place to live, you know, in the, in the country. Um, you know, you're working hard to make, make a living. So I know it sounds corny, but I, I think of the fact that, you know, your blogging is helping your family. I mean, you know, it, maybe not in an indirect way or direct way, but I, I would think you, you have some pride in what you've done along those sides as far as built a name, be able to support a family, help your kids, send them off to college when, they want, when they're ready to go. I mean, I mean, do you ever think about that part of it at all? Absolutely. My <laughs> kids know about my blogs. What do they say about it? Um, they think it's neat. They think, <laughs> you know, they, they don't fully understand it. They're 13, 11, and 9, so they're not deeply invested in intellectual <laughs> property or what dad does besides whether my office is good for hide and seek. But um, <laughs> but they're aware that I'm doing it. They're aware that it's an important part of my job. Um, and it definitely has helped me uh, succeed at the law firm, succeed in the practice of law, and uh, support my family. The other thing it's done is it's built friendships. Uh, it's built a lot of friendships for me within the legal community, some in IP, some beyond IP, that have taken a profession that can be somewhat insular and made it a much more pleasant practice. That's pretty. That's pretty cool. You know, it's important it, to me because the litigation can get pretty onerous as far as <coughs> very contentious. Um, where you've broken that down. <coughs> Last thing I just like to ask ask you, and I'm not necessarily going to play this out for <coughs> uh, bloggers and learning, but what what has Lexblog done for you? What has it been its role over the years? I'm I'm almost more curious than anything. <coughs> but did, have we played a role in, in helping you along the way? Oh yeah. I mean, the first thing was you guys taught me how to do it. I mean, you built the website, and that was important, but probably I could have found someone else to build a website. Right. And frankly, 15 years ago, the website didn't have to look as good right. as it did today. I initially published a little bit of my own on a blogger platform. Right, which um, was free. Which was free, <coughs> um, with a terrible pun as a title. I forget what it was, but mercifully, <laughs> you steered me away from the bad pun. Uh, you, um, you taught me how to blog and what I should expect to do. And you set expectations for me of mm -hmm. what success would look like. And that helped me not get disillusioned and keep going. And you develop that community. I mean, a lot of the community that I talk about is really started by Lexblog. You got me involved with um, the guy from the, the anonymous editor oh, that yeah. uh, who passed away, yeah. but um, who did the weekly roundup. That's thing. right. Um, and he connected me to other people, and then there were other people within the Lexblog community that I got to know because they were Lexblog bloggers. And a lot of education, um, you know, you guys used to have some webinars and things like that, right. that I would attend and I would learn either something about the platform or something about how to blog better. And then, of course, the Real Lawyers blog, which right. I've always read to find out what's happening or what I should be thinking about next. Yeah, and, it, and it's something we're trying to get back to stronger to get back to our roots. Because I still remember the first time I chatted with you in a, <coughs> you know, a two-person office, you know, down by the water on Bainbridge Island, you know, and uh, and you were a really good client because you, <coughs> you, you didn't you didn't let me go. I mean, four months in, five months in, down the road, is this going to work for me? <coughs> yeah, and th at that time, I'm telling you, I have some faith because, I, you know, I had only started the company, you know, half a year before. So I didn't have people like you that it had worked for. Um, but that that idea of you're going to taste something probably in the first <laughs> 180 days, right. <laughs> don't know what it's going to be, um, you're going to get a year and you're going to go, okay, this seems to be something that could really work. And that by the second year, it's going to start to, should start to really take off. Um, uh, but it, like you said, it's not, not easy uh, to do that. Last question, what's the difference between a successful blogger and those that fail? Is it just consistency? Or is it more than that? I think it's more than consistency. I think it's consistent quality. Because um, if it's not good content, if it's not well written, if it doesn't present you well, it's- What's quality? 
I mean, it, when you look at a blog, what, what grabs you? Um, well written, has some ideas. Thought. Um, thought, yeah. It, it's, it's more than, like, there are a couple of um, guys that are out there that now republish their old content just over and over again. <laughs> and they're honest. It'll say, republish from some date. Um, that's not, to me, that's kind of a failure. Right. Uh, because once you see that, you feel a little snookered. Yeah. <laughs> um, it may still be good content. Um, like, in fact, as we've been talking, I've been realizing there are a couple of posts that I need to update and republish. But I'll update them and republish them, and I'll tell them that I published it before, but I've revised it, added to it, changed it. Um, but I think it's, it's quality, and that can mean a lot of things depending on what you're writing about. I mean, for me, I'm writing in the Chicago blog about cases. So most of my ideas are earth shattering, but they're concise, they're correct, um, they're, they drive the points that people need from them. Um, I think that's what quality is there. And they're consistent, they all look the same. Thank you, sir. Thank you.